So every homomorphism from one group to another group gives us a wealth of information about those groups. The first isomorphism theorem most crucially tells us that a homomorphism from G to H gives us two things. It gives us a normal subgroup of G in the form of the kernel of that homomorphism. And it also tells us about the factor group of G by that kernel being isomorphic to the image of that homomorphism. This is great. I want to wrap up this series of videos by looking at two uses of the first isomorphism theorem that should help to convince you, if you're not already convinced, that the first isomorphism theorem is really your friend in characterizing the properties of groups and factor groups that you might not otherwise have a good way of getting your hands around. So we'll look at two examples. The first one is fairly concrete. We're going to use the first isomorphism theorem to characterize a factor group of a group by one of its normal subgroups. And then our second example we're going to look at is a little bit more abstract, which is going to help us to see why the first isomorphism theorem can tell us something about the properties of a group that we don't really know anything about other than the existence of a certain homomorphism. So in this example, what I want to do is look at the multiplicative group of non-zero real numbers. So all the real numbers except for zero with the operation of multiplication, that forms a group. And the subgroup consisting of the numbers plus and minus one, that's a subgroup of this group, and because r star is abelian, multiplication of real numbers is commutative, that makes it a normal subgroup. So the question is, what can we say about this factor group? What is this factor group really? r star mod plus one and minus one. How can we use the first isomorphism theorem to say something about a group that we might know, but a factor group that we might not know how to understand otherwise? So the key here is if I want to know what the factor group is, the first isomorphism theorem will tell me that it's isomorphic to the image of a homomorphism out of G whose kernel is exactly this normal subgroup. And remember, every normal subgroup is the kernel of some homomorphism. So the way to approach a problem like this is to try to find a homomorphism whose domain is R star, whose target group is any group that we want. That's one of the great pieces of flexibility that we have. We, we can put absolutely any group as the target group here, as long as we can make the kernel of that homomorphism exactly the normal subgroup that we're trying to quotient by, namely, in this example, plus 1 and minus 1. So how do I find a homomorphism out of the multiplicative group of real numbers that kills exactly the subset 1 and minus 1? So what I'm really kind of asking is almost like a high school algebra question. Is there a function which we can find that erases the difference between the real numbers plus 1 and minus 1, and which also preserves the operation of the multiplicative group of non-zero real numbers? In other words, it needs to respect the multiplication. Uh, phi of x times y it has to be phi of x composed with phi of y. And we know of a function from high school algebra that does this, the absolute value function. After all, the absolute value function is going to blur the distinction between the number positive 1 and the number negative 1, because the absolute value of both 1 and minus 1 are the same. And it's also going to preserve the operation of the multiplicative real numbers, because the absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values for real numbers. Phi of xy is the absolute value of x times y, but you probably proved back in high school algebra that the absolute value of xy is the absolute value of x times the absolute value of y. So this phi is indeed a homomorphism from r star to r star. And its kernel is exactly 1 and minus 1, because the identity element of r star, namely 1, has as its inverse image exactly those numbers whose absolute value is negative 1. So that's 1 and minus 1. So this is the function that's going to do our work for us. All we have to do is apply the first isomorphism theorem. So what are the cosets? of the kernel over here going to look like. Well, an example of a coset would be 2 times this kernel, so 2 and minus 2, or square root of 6 times it, or pi times it, right? Those are cosets, which in R star we consider to be made up of two elements each. But those two elements are both mapping to the same spot under the absolute value function. And so the quotient, R star quotient plus and minus 1, is going to blur the distinction between those different elements of the same coset. So this is now going to be thought of as the single element 1k, this is going to be thought of as the single element 2k, this one is square root of 6k, this one is pi k. And I want to know more about the algebraic structure of this group here in the middle. To do that, I'm going to instead look at the algebraic structure of the image group of phi as a subgroup of r star. 
And as any high school algebra student will tell you, the absolute value of any non-zero real number is always going to be a positive real number. And so the image of phi is not going to be all of r star, but it's going to consist exactly of all the positive real numbers inside of r star. And because the first isomorphism theorem tells me that the image of this homomorphism is isomorphic to the factor group, that means that the factor group is isomorphic to the group under multiplication that consists of all the positive real numbers. So what do you get when you take all non-zero real numbers and then you blur the distinction between plus and minus one by passing to the factor group? We get a new group that's exactly isomorphic to the group of all positive real numbers. When you don't see the difference between positive and negative, you can just think of everything as positive. And I think not only is that a good algebra lesson, that's a good lesson for life also. Let's close with an example that I think really illustrates the power of the first isomorphism theorem as an exploratory tool to tell us something about a group that we otherwise have no information about at all. In this example, we assume that G is a group that we know nothing about other than that its order is more than 8. So it could be a really big group. It could be infinite. It could be order 9, something really boring. But all we know is that it has more than 8 elements in it. And we know that there exists a homomorphism from G into Z mod 8, and that that homomorphism is not trivial. So it can't send everything in the group to the identity at 0 in Z mod 8. It's got to do something else. And the conclusion we want to draw is that G is not a simple group. In other words, we want to be able to say something about this group G that we know nothing at all about. Specifically, we want to show the existence of this non-trivial homomorphism into Z mod 8 guarantees that my group is not a simple group, that there exists a normal subgroup of G besides the identity element and besides the entire group. All right, so what is the picture going to look like here? Well, the first isomorphism theorem is going to tell me that this non-trivial homomorphism from G into Z mod 8 is going to, what we sometimes say, factor through the image of phi on the one hand and the factor group G mod K on the other hand. And the fact that the image of phi is a part of this chain here is actually what gives us our start in this problem. Because we know that the image of phi must necessarily be a subgroup of the target group Z mod 8. And so what do we know? Can this image of phi be the trivial subgroup? Well, the answer to that is no, because we've assumed that my homomorphism is not the trivial homomorphism. If it were the trivial homomorphism, then its image would include just 0. But it's not trivial. And so we have to have a non-trivial subgroup of Z mod 8 be the image of phi. And because Z mod 8 is a cyclic group, we know exactly what its subgroups are. So there's only three that are non-trivial. The whole group itself, the subgroup generated by the element 2, which has order 4, and the subgroup generated by the element 4, which has order 2. So the image has got to be one of these three things. Let's take, for example, the subgroup generated by 2. Let's suppose that that's the image of my homomorphism. What is that then going to tell me? Well, that's going to tell me, according to the first isomorphism theorem, that there exists a normal subgroup of G, namely the kernel of this homomorphism, which is one of four disjoint cosets that partition my group G. Because of the isomorphism between the factor group, the group of the cosets of K, and the image group, which we decided, just for hypothesis here, was the group 0, 2, 4, and 6, which is isomorphic to Z mod 4. So what that tells me, if I back up to the group G, is that there exists a normal subgroup K of G, namely the kernel of this homomorphism, and the index of that normal subgroup is 4. So that the cosets of that normal subgroup partition G into 4 pieces. So the index of K in G is by definition the number of cosets that k has in g, which is equal to the order of the factor group. But according to the first isomorphism theorem, the order of the factor group is the same thing as the order of the image of phi. After all, isomorphism preserves the order of two groups. So the order of g mod k is equal to the order of the image of phi, and in this example we chose an image of phi which has four elements in it. And so if, for example, the image of phi is this subgroup 0, 2, 4, 6, that means that G has an index 4 subgroup. And since that index is bigger than 1, we know that K is not the entire group, so it's a, in fact a proper normal subgroup. And also, the only way that this subgroup would be a trivial subgroup 
is if there were only four elements in G to begin with. And we knew in this hypothesis here that there were at least eight elements in G to begin with. So K is not only a proper normal subgroup, but it's also not a trivial normal subgroup. And therefore, it's a subgroup that fits in the middle between triviality and being the whole group. And that subgroup will show that G is not simple. So that's just sort of a special case. Let's just write up the general proof. The kernel of this homomorphism is going to be a normal subgroup of G. And the index of that normal subgroup is going to be equal to the order of the image of phi. And there is my application of the first isomorphism theorem, right? because of this isomorphism right there. And we've decided that that image is going to have either two, four, or eight elements. It can't have one because my homomorphism is non-trivial. Since the index in G of K we know is not equal to one, that means that K is definitely a proper normal subgroup. It's not the whole group itself. And since the index in G of K is less than the order of the group, because the order of the group we know is at least nine, we know that K is also a non-trivial normal subgroup. And therefore, we've proven that there exists at least one normal subgroup that's not the trivial group and not the whole group. And all we needed to know was that there was a non-trivial homomorphism from G into Z mod 8. So that's a really powerful sort of theoretical upshot of what the first isomorphism theorem can do for us. We have a group we know nothing about except that it has a non-trivial homomorphism into Z mod 8. That then guarantees that the group on this side cannot be a simple group, regardless of whether that group is finite, whether it's not finite, whether it's cyclic, whether it's abelian, whether it has any other properties we want. Whatever that group is, it cannot be a simple group because it has this non-trivial homomorphism into Z mod 8.